The first ice machine was invented in 1845 by Floridian John Gorey, and in 1868 was the first commercial ice plant. And, and there's a story about a Mississippi preacher in, as late as 1902 who had to step down from his post because he told his congregation that he had visited an, uh, an, an artificial ice plant and had seen ice being made. And they made him step down from his job because they thought it was crazy because people can't, you know, make cold. Uh, and, and they just, because it was, it's unfathomable in Mississippi in 1902 that anyone could just, it could just create cold from scratch. Um, what the ice plants do is they make these big 300 pound blocks that are four feet by two feet by one foot. It takes three days to make a clear block of ice. Clear ice is better than foggy ice uh, because it's denser and it, it lasts longer. And to make a clear block of ice, you have to keep all the water moving while you make it to get all the air bubbles out of the system. Uh, and then the ice man would come along with a donkey and drop ice off to people. And he had like a donkey and then a big cart and a big block of ice. And, uh, and then he would go around and he would take an ice pick and he would chip off like, you know, a 25 or 50 or, or 75 or 100 pound chunk of ice. And then he would go into people's houses and he'd put it in the ice box, which was, you know, just like a thing to keep ice cold. It was not like a refrigerator, but just like a thing that you, and then if you, and then if you wanted ice, or if you were, and then you go to your ice box and you chip off some ice and put it in the drinks and give it to people. And this was like, you know, it was like 1870, right? Uh, was that what you, and you're poor, you didn't have an icebox, they would literally you'd put your ice in the ground with sawdust, and I guess you could dig it up later and use an ice pick to get ice for your drinks or whatever you were doing with it. Um, by 1920, manufactured ice added a billion dollars a year to the income of the United States and ranked ninth in the amount of investment in American commercial enterprises. 1920 U.S. Census, there are 4,800 block ice plants employed, uh, 160,000 people and produced 40 million tons of ice. That's 750,000 uh, blocks of ice every 24 hours. Businesses could run because of this stuff. It was revolutionary. Suddenly, you could do chicken farming, bakeries, florists, fruits, vegetables, fish, year-round. It effectively ended scurvy, and ice was so vital that if you worked in an ice plant during World War I or World War II, you were allowed not to go to war. I mean, that's unfathomable. Um, and movie theaters would, would keep patrons cold by they, they would have a big fan and then they would just put blocks of ice in front of the fan to keep the cold air moving to keep people cold. But of course the more people that were in the theater, the more blocks of ice had to be destroyed to keep everybody chilled, which is why to this day a movie that which a lot of people go to is called a blockbuster. That's where the term blockbuster comes from because you would destroy blocks of ice in, in, in doing the movie. Um, by 1960s, very few homes had block ice because of refrigerators, which made it completely obsolete. Um, which brings me to my main point about basic instinct, which is why the fuck does anyone have block ice in this movie? As of 1960, <laughs> no one needs this anymore. Um, and I, I thought that I emailed all of my relatives asking about this, and like uh, block on ice that you would need an ice an ice pick to get to. It would be absurd. I mean, it's possible to have that, but extremely bizarre. But everybody in this movie is, like, very casual about their ice picks. Sharon Stone's like, oh, I'll make you a drink. And she gets, like, block ice out and starts hacking at it with an ice pick. And then Michael Douglas has it at his house as well. Because if she just has it at some kind of weird sort of foppy thing that she's got, <laughs> right? But no, they both have this at their apartments. Like, it's a natural thing in the world. He's like, eh, ice pick. Three ninety nine at Kmart. You cannot get an ice pick at Kmart or CVS or I looked for it. I went to Key Foods to buy. You cannot. I didn't order it over the internet. You can't get an ice pick. It's completely b bizarre, and it points to exactly uh, what makes Basic Instinct awesome, which is that the movie doesn't make any sense. Uh, you can't even get ice at Key Foods. Ice pick. You just go. You go get ice, right? We have ice trays and things. How much? Come on in, join. How much is an ice pick? You order it online. It's like it's like seven dollars, and now I'm on like an FBI watch list. As well, so I feel like that's not good. Um, yeah, so and, and and so and Michael Douglas says that he got this ice pick. He was like, oh, I got a Kmart. And he, it implies that he got it recently, but not only can you not get an ice pick at Kmart, but like when did he have time to go ice pick shopping in the last couple of days? As you'll see in the movie, uh, Michael Douglas' character is extremely busy. Um, so the movie is completely ridiculous. Uh, Paul, this is directed by Paul Verhoeven, written by Joe Esterhouse, stars Sharon Stone, Michael Douglas, George Denunza, Gene Triplehorn. Um, it's, uh, uh, and I, Paul Verhoeven also directed Starship Troopers, uh, which is one of my favorite movies. And I saw Starship Troopers, um, and I, I, sitting in, I wasn't that old, but sitting in front of me were a group of kids who were maybe like five years younger than me. They were like 17 or something. Um, and I was laughing all the way through Starship Troopers, and I got shushed a couple of times. Uh, because they, they didn't get it. Like,
like it's it's possible to watch a movie like Starship Troopers if you're too young and not understand this is like really funny because they put Doogie Howser is actually wearing like a Nazi uniform and he's one of the good guys. So it's you know, but if you don't know that, you're like, oh wow, that's amazing. No, 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 this is a ridiculous movie. You should be laughing at Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers is funny. Basic Instinct is funny. Too many people take this movie too seriously. Um, it has a kind of European sense of he's uh, Paul Verhoeven's Dutch, and and it has a kind of European sense of humor that doesn't always point to itself, but it's a very funny movie. Um, and the, my, my favorite example of this movie is you'll see in the, when they go to the club, uh, Roxy uh, has this dance style that she does in the movie when, they, it's, when she goes to the club and she dances like this. <laughs> and it's the like, most ridiculous looking thing. And if you could watch that and take it seriously, you've somehow missed the point of the movie. Like, it's really, it points towards uh, his Showgirls, which is another movie that Paul Verhoeven did, which is... Uh, as a friend of mine said, the least sexy movie about sex ever. Uh, I would put Eyes Wide Shut in the running there, but it's pretty uh. bad. Um, it's Basic Instinct is a completely ridiculous movie. Jean Triplehorn, her first scene in the movie, she's like the therapist, um, and she has these like big glasses, and she's a doctor, uh, you know. And she, but she looks like one of those like scientists, like female scientists in a porno movie. Do you know, she has that kind mm. of like, oh, doctor, you fixed the wrong chemicals, and mm. now I'm a lesbian. Um, I mean, it's she's ridiculous. Um, they, they, there's, there's all these weird details in the movie that just, like, should make you laugh. Every time they go to Gene Triplehorn's apartment, through the window across the street, you can see there's, like, a dance troupe or something, or there's, like, an aerobics class, and it's always going on. People are always doing aerobics, like, across the window from Gene Triplehorn's apartment in the movie. There's a scene where, uh, I won't spoil anything, but uh, someone gets shot with a revolver, and someone else says, oh, it's, 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 someone gets shot in the movie, and the cops go, oh, yeah, it's a revolver. Give me your gun. And then he, he takes the gun and he sort of, he sniffs it and he goes, uh, and he's checking to see if it's been fired recently. The gun that he sniffs is not a revolver. You don't need to sniff the gun to find out he didn't do it. It's not a revolver. Like, it doesn't, the movie is absolutely silly. There's this bizarre thing, there's this bizarre sort of subplot where, I don't know if you call it a plot, um, but George, uh, Michael Douglas and, and George Denunza, his partner, they're like cowboys together. They, they, George Denunza calls Douglas hoss all the time, and then at one point they go to a cowboy bar which I guess it strikes me as like Verhoeven's idea of like what America is like. It's a weird counterpoint to all of the like the like bisexual lesbian stuff, and then all the men they go to a cowboy bar and they wear cowboy hats and call each other hoss, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, the cowboy stuff's not out of nowhere, right? I mean, this movie is as uh, has been said, it's an assault on the American male, and it's worth remembering that that Michael Douglas's father is one of the quintessential tough guys, uh, as uh, Kirk Douglas. Um, Verhoeven said that he wanted this to be the first mainstream Hollywood movie with an erect penis. Uh, he, he did not get his wish, although there is a flaccid penis in the opening. Mm. Um, uh, 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 he refused to cut the shot of uh, the famous shot in the movie of Sharon Stone's vagina. Um, so he got so he got that, but he didn't get the erect penis. Um, but the whole movie is like thoroughly ridiculous. Um, the whole movie revolves around the, the whole plot. You watch the thing and you go, if it was SVU, right? If it was like Law and Order SVU, they just Get get it because they, they get a DNA sample and the movie would be over in like twenty minutes. And if, you know, if they didn't get a DNA sample, they would I don't know what they would. Um, they would like it would be obstruction of justice, and that'd be it. DNA never comes up. Obstruction of justice never comes up. It's all like this psycho mind bending stuff. Um, if it was Elliot Stabler from Law and Order SVU, he would completely uh, take down uh, all the bad guys in this movie. <laughs> um, I think it's interesting too that this movie, um, for most of the movie. Uh, the, the, the whole first act of the movie is spent wondering whether Sharon Stone is some kind of, uh, you know, psychosexual killer. Um, and I think it's amazing that, that Sharon Stone is now going to be joining the cast of Law & Order SVU as a cop, I think. Um, so she's now going to be the person who investigates sex crimes. Um, which is particularly funny because on SVU, they all <laughs> Ice-T is a cop on SVU. And many of my students... Uh, are only familiar with Ice-T as a cop because he's been playing a cop for like 10 or 15 years and they, they're not aware that he used to be the guy that raps about, you know, killing cops. Um, this is a movie where anyone who has a degree in psychology, even an undergraduate degree, uh, has basically mind control powers uh, and brainwashing techniques. I mean, there's a terror of people that have degrees in things. Um, and in my all-time favorite line in the movie, um, George Denunza says... That magna cum laude pussy done fried up your brain. Mm. If you, Joe Esterhaus wrote that down. He sold the screenplay for for three million dollars. It was an unheard of amount of money, and he wrote that down. And George and Paul Verhoeven said, "Let's do this." And then George Nunza said, "I will say that line out loud." And Michael Douglas was like, "I can hear that line and not laugh when you say that." <laughs> it is the silliest line in the entire movie. 
Um, yes. Uh, the movie was protested by uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender groups because even way long before, right, in the early days it leaked out that it sort of didn't treat bisexuals and, and, and lesbians very well. Uh, and Vera Gruppman had to send out fake call sheets to confuse protesters, and 50 cops were required to be on set every day to protect, uh, to protect the filming of the movie. Um, mm. Joe Esterhaus wanted to make changes to appease them, and Vera Gruppman absolutely refused to make any changes to appease the lesbian and gay community. Um, Camille Paglia, uh, Camille Paglia has a, a voiceover commentary on the ultimate edition of Basic Instinct, two hours of Camille Paglia talking over uh, basic Instincts. And she said, if you made this movie today, you'd have to have like a nice lesbian couple across the street uh, who would, you know, show that, you know, not all gay people are evil or something. Um, and, it, and it's a very, like, nice, very reasonable idea, but this nothing about this movie is reasonable. The, the thing that makes this movie awesome is its total commitment to unreasonableness and insanity. Uh, and that's what makes it good, which is exactly what makes Starship Troopers good, and, and this is very Hoopman's sort of style. Um, whatever complaint you want to make about the movie, a lack of commitment isn't going to be one of them. Um, so it's an awesome movie, um, and if you can't laugh at it, you're going to be missing some of the awesome. So in addition to, I, I don't want anybody to shush me while I'm watching this movie, while I'm laughing, and I would appreciate it if you would laugh with me. Yeah. I'm done.